Ya. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Robin Hager, and tonight we are having a, a celebration of life for fellow poet and uh, friend of a lot of peoples in this area, uh, Ron Whiters. Um, I know Ron very specifically from this setting at Greenkill. Uh, I met him a few years ago here at the Voiceless Readings and just hearing him perform every week was such a pleasure and you know he inspired me to be so much more open with myself and my own writing and not to feel afraid of uncensoring myself in any way and um, that's one thing I've taken from Ron and I think so many people have many great stories to tell about him and that's what we're celebrating here tonight and yeah so let's Without further ado, let's go to the reading. And we have our first speaker of the night, a very special speaker. Um, we're gonna play. Hmm? Okay. And so our first uh, speaker is gonna be Mike Dracovic. Gibson. While working at IBM in the mid 80s, he appeared as a guest consultant with Anthony Fast in two broadcasts of classical music on the Vassar College radio station show, Treasures from Captain Classics Collection. Ron performed regularly at the Rosendale Creative Space Co-op from 89 to 92. He's performed annually at the Cave Readings at the Widow Jane Mine in Rosendale from 91 through 97. He starred in the ingenious IT performance Oxnex in Tweed on April 3rd, 1992, and slammed at the New Yorican Cafe in New York City during these years. He performed at Woodstock Guild's Birdcliff Barn as part of Summer Jazz FM, FM Artist Coalition in 92. He performed as a, main, as a featured poet at the Out Loud Festival in Claryville in 94. Um, he was also a part of the Steve Carney show, Knock on Wood on AMC Albany Public Radio. He featured it in a brief biographic film, Trapped in Amber by Bart Thrall of Big Time Records 2006. He hosted the 19th annual Hudson Valley Poets Fest at the wonderful Widow Jane Mine 2009 and featured at the 2010 Albany Word Fest, the 17th annual Bowery Poetry Club Spoken Word, and, it, and Ron's publications include Roundout Review, the Abraxas Magazine, the Poets Gallery, good old Chronogram, Hunger Magazine, Was Buzzin' in Switzerland, Arabesque, the Home Planet News, Heyday Magazine, Lifeblood, and In Then Magazine. My friend, Mr. Ron Whiters. Hello, my name is Ron Whiters, or R. Dionysius Whiters, and my first two poems will be political rants. Planning to retire? Not one kopeck, not one drachma, not one pfennig, not one sou, not one shilling, not one tuppence, not one farthing, not for you, not one nickel, not one token, not one shekel, not one but two. Not one peso. Not one centine. Not one trace of an I O U. Don't play canasta with the paymaster. Swallow that laughter, jokes on you. Court with disaster, trouble comes faster. Not 
one T after from Uncle Sam Do. And I'm here to say our next reader is Andrew Austin. Um, I was a uh, regular participant in voiceless readings here at Greenkill for about two years, and just about every week, Ron Wyders would come and read, and everybody loved him. He was such an excellent performer. He was fascinating to watch. And I got to know him a little bit off stage as well. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And, uh, and I'm glad to be able to be here tonight to honor him. Uh, during the time that we were uh, both participating in voiceless readings, he gave me, as a gift, a copy of his self-published book of poetry and prose, Crowns I've Made and Other Regalia. Uh, it was uh, on my uh, big reading pile and it took me a while to get to it, but I finally got to reading it and I loved it. And by that time, Ron had uh, moved into a nursing home and he wasn't going out to uh, readings regularly anymore, but I read I read the poems and I read the prose and I enjoyed it very much and uh, I tracked down the number of his room at the nursing home and I called him up just to let him know uh, that I had read his book and I enjoyed it and he thanked me and that was the last time he and I ever spoke to one another. A couple of months after that I heard the sad news that he had passed away. Uh, as I said, I'm so glad to be able to be here tonight to honor this wonderful man, and I would like to read a little bit from Crowns I Have Made. What I actually want to read, um, I don't want to read the poems, as wonderful as they are. What I'd actually like to read is the first uh, chapter's prose, because it tells a little bit about him as a person. I'm going to skip over a little bit for time, but you'll get the basic gist of uh, the chapter as I read it here. Chapter 1, First Coronation, New Paltz, 1969. This tale begins, believe it or not, in the year 1953. My family, living in a pleasant neighborhood of mixed ethnicity in Bronxboro between West Farms and what was a new upper middle class development called Park Chester at 1721 Van Buren St Street, was at this time rather eagerly preparing to make a monumentous move across the Hudson to property that my father, a postal clerk of some 20 years at the time, had purchased during the Great Depression in the hills of Mawa, New Jersey. We would plummet instantly from a seemingly safe, lower middle class existence to a desperately poor and barely surviving first year of struggle, building a house in a civic and atmospheric environment of general hostility. In Mawa, New Jersey, the weather would vie with the neighborhood in testing the Whiters family for the next few years to come. Adding to that was the fact that the author in those tender years increasingly discovered himself to be gay without knowing what to call it and absolutely had to keep this discovery under wraps because after all, it was the 1950s in a black authoritarian family environment that became, as those years wore on, more threatening with an increasingly hostile father and nearest brother especially after the sudden upheaval of his mother's death in a car plunging over a hairpin turn to a 50-foot drop onto a highway, the pressures grew so much sharper. But it is still early in 1953. None of those things had happened yet. We are still in the Bronx. In our innocence, we have witnessed many wonders of the early 1950s, including the pageant of a whole new 1949 across-the-board styling for America's automobiles the incredible emergence of jet planes in the Korean War. There were almost no commercial jet airliners then, just piston engine transports and liners everywhere overhead in the skies of New York City. The miracle of Bobby Thompson at Coogan's Bluff in 1951, soon to repeat itself in the New York Giants, right, the baseball New York Giants, in 1954. The mesmerizing glory of Lionel and American Flyer trains at Christmas time. What could top these wonders and many more in those exciting earliest years? I was nine years old in 1953, and I vividly remember the sudden spectacle on June 2nd that appeared on our TV set at home. Clearly, my mother must have been eagerly awaiting the occasion. It was the last big spectacle on TV before we moved from the city to take the plunge into years of darkness and struggle. 
without electricity, without plumbing, without free time, without comfort several years down the road. On June 2nd, 1953, Great Britain formally crowned its new sovereign, the young Queen Elizabeth II, and televised the occasion around the world live. It was the first time such a thing was done on TV in history, and this nine-year-old was there, mouth agog, to witness such resplendent history in the making from halfway around the world. Black and white TV, all the more engaging, leading an impressionable nine-year-old mind to imagine color and to invent worlds and worlds and worlds of pageantry and empires for many years to come. He needed that imagination to get him through the early trials and travails of life in the hills of New Jersey. And the defense mechanisms he developed in those virgin years still rule his consciousness today. Fast forward 14 years to 1967. It is my second year as a transfer student, a senior, from Rockland Community College in Suffern, New York, to New Paltz. I am living at 60 Church Street, an incredible house, chock full of poets, artists, and avant-garde thinkers on the one hand, and the occasional dredges of the heart local hardcore drug scene on the other. I am a US Army reservist, as well as radicalized anti-Vietnam war activist, soaking in the new vibes of counterculture while matriculating at SUNY New Paltz, being arrested in demonstrations repeatedly, but being stimulated mightily by things like J.R.R. Tolkien and the ring cycle dramas of Richard Wagner. I would have heroes, local heroes, distant heroes, and imaginary heroes, a rather complex blend of regally conservative influences and explosively radical ones was enriching the elixir of my existence. I simply did not need chemical drugs or alcohol for stimulation. There were gobs, or gods, of stimulation everywhere around me. And this remains true even down to the very moment I am writing. There was a famous occasion when I accidentally imbibed a ton of hash brownies, but that is another tale. Susanna Swan was my first subletting landlord at 60 Church Street, and a couple of years later, Deirdre Lewis, Winbottom, Ken Cluen, Joanne Trilling, and then he proceeds to uh, list a large number of other people. I'll just skip down. They were my neighbors there. Stimulation, stimulation, stimulation. And the rent started at $25 a month. And then, in town, I met Michael Horowitz, soon to become McHale in 1970, and George Tuckle almost simultaneously. And next, Ruth Wright, through another friend, Victor Hanzar. I hope I pronounced that correctly, I'm sorry. And next, Harold Channer through Mikhail Horowitz. With the Wright family meeting the Channer family, two great bastions and refuge households of counterculture were joined together and somehow a lightning bolt idea took hold in my head to celebrate the occasion in a way that only I could devise. I was a desperately poor student, like most of those around me, but I had been making things like men's fur hats, something like coonskin hats, caps without the tails, from old fur coats from sometime in the years 1967 to 1960, 1966 to 1967. Some of these I would wear myself and some I would give away as Christmas presents to old Rockland County counterculture friends. I also was making fancy electric table lamps from stacked brass ashtrays and other objects on hand during this time. In 1967, this business had involved in the making of my first helmet crowns kind of experimentally concocted from ordinary, ordinary mesh kitchen strainers that I covered with black felt and removed the handles from, then decorated with added stuff like ornate dresser poles. Voila, my first two crowns, really glorified helmets, that I named the Kronhelm, with a very crude paper mache horn attached, and the Vogelhelm, with wings fashioned from clustered chicken feathers. I have no pictures of these early creations. They were crude, complex, and flimsy, but they lasted two or three years because they simply sat on my shelf. Now in that same year, I began making my first queen's crown, and I just happened to have, I don't remember the source, some rather heavy, stiff sheet aluminum. It was about three times the thickness of a base plate from a Gilbert Erector set. I devised a pattern in my mind, scribed it on the metal, and began cutting with scissors. I destroyed at least two pairs of scissors, wore out one file and tons of sandpaper, and suffered from sore and cut fingers for months to come. It was a murderous task, but this would become the crown of Ruth Wright. It was a marvel of creation, one of my all-time best, best crowns, an elegant circulate of subtly rising tines resembling a diadem. 
although completely closed in the back. Each time was topped, each time was topped by a ball fashioned from a Christmas jingle bell. Absolute simplicity and very sturdy, meant to last a lifetime. It didn't last a lifetime. According to Ruth, just a few years later, people played with it endlessly, men and women, adults and children alike. Things got lost or broken and the crown disappeared. Ruth's and Harold's scepters were made mostly from cafe rods decorated on the top with appropriate found items. Ruth Orbs is a classic adaption and modification of a copper bathroom f toilet floating ball with various plumbing fixtures screwed on above it in the shape of a cross. Next, I began Harold Channer's crown. This would be a mitered crown, the only such crown I ever made, roughly like the imperial crowns of the Austrian Habsburgs or the Russian Romanovs. So I actually purchased something from an Army Navy store. I bought a British-style safari pith helmet on a vague notion, trimmed off the front and rear Sherlock Holmes beaks, and cut, cut the remaining thing down to, in the middle so that there were two separate hemispheres left. I trimmed the two halves so that there was a middle... I trimmed the two halves so that there was a wedge of separation when the bottoms were brought together, with wider space on the top tapering down and a triangle joined at the bottom. I reinforced the bottom joint, sewed red felt or red silk into the wedge triangle to make a mitered look, painted the outer surfaces with cheap gold paint, added jewels and pearls, and voila! Much easier effort than Ruth's crown and almost as stunning a result. I was getting really good at this sort of thing, I remember thinking. It was fairly sturdy, well-made in other words, though not quite as solid as Ruth's crown. It did not last. According to Harold, just a few years later, people played with it endlessly. Things got lost and broken. The crown disappeared. Finally, I was left with the problem of Mike Horowitz, who would be crowned prince at age 19 in the ceremony. I had no problem deciding exactly who would be crowned. This was a given the moment the idea of a coronation hit me. The kind of artifact would I, what kind of artifact would I use to honor this immature but already transcendent spirit? I didn't want to make another crown. Somehow, I have never made the same type of crown twice in all these years. It's an unwritten rule that I follow naturally. For this occasion, I needed something regal that was not a crown. At last, it occurred to me, a sword. I already had a self-made sword in my arsenal, but I couldn't part with it. So I fidgeted around and finally took a hole punch, the scissor-shaped kind that is used to make holes in loose leaf paper, and pulled it apart disassembled it to make the S-shaped hilt of a sword. I couldn't remember what I used for a blade, probably flattened out copper tubing, but this, with added jewels and decorations, is what I presented to Mike at the ceremony. It was not a very solid item. I did not know how to securely attach either metal to metal or jewels to metal in those days. I was a novice. It did not last. According to Mike, a few years later, people played with it endlessly. Things got lost and broken the sword disappeared. Various friends were alerted or forewarned. I planned to write three English sonnets for the ceremony. I set a date and the coronation occurred at Harold Channer's house at some time early in 1969. It was a short and simple ceremony photographed by poet Alan Davis Drake. Photos, many faded unfortunately, followed of the ceremony. Some of the witnesses and copies of the three English sonnets I wrote and, recite, and recited for the occasion. There was no music for this event. If my addled brain could have thought of it, there surely would have been music. Ron, thank you for the gift of the book and thank you for all your poetry. Wherever you are, I hope you enjoy the show tonight. Thank you, everyone. All right, tremendous. You know, hearing that account, it, it's, I, it found words for something about Ron was that there was this incredible formality about him and this just ridiculous outrageousness together. Yeah. Uh, if there is anyone who's not on this somewhat short list, very short list, who wants to read, just let me know. All right. Uh, Robin, you're back. Um, so... In the midst of me trying to decide what I was going to read today, I was gifted a book from a dear friend of mine who is here. And thank you, Melissa. <laughs> and it is this book of uh, Japanese death poems. And they are um, 
poems written on the verge of death by uh, Zen Buddhist monks and then uh, haiku, uh, Japanese haiku uh, writers uh, and poets. And I decided to write, um, today I decided to write a collection of haikus for this reading. Um, and I just wanted to go over some some like symbolism that I found in the intro of this book that was like um, inspired, like my decision to, you know, uh, make these haikus. But um, so I imagined this reading um, as a kind of offering in a way, as, as offerings are um, what the, what it's it, it's really important in Japanese culture to provide offerings to uh, their recently deceased, so they can transition peacefully into the afterlife, um, which they, they call paradise. So that's how I will be referring to it in this reading, and um, they're not only a way to pay homage to a, a friend, colleague, um, mentor, or in this fa in in this um, situation, a fellow creator, but um, to pay your respects. Uh, and I thought this would be the perfect way for me to pay my own respects to Ron in order to have him uh, have a nice transition into his own sense of paradise. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to like read this one little section that struck me. Uh, so, and according to Japanese tradition, the deceased do not pass over immediately to a world from which no return is possible. Um, one belief is that the spirit of the dead person remains near the world of the living for 49 days. Uh, I thought all these traditions and beliefs were super interesting. And um, I wanted to just read uh, a few haikus from this book before I started my own reading. Um, this one is by a haiku poet named Chogo. I long for people, then again I loathe them, end of autumn. Um, this one is by Chosui. I wait, white clouds and dark clouds passing, a cuckoo cries. And um, the one right before this I really like too. It's by uh, Choshi. On its, on its way west to paradise, migrating bird. And then I wanted to read one more that's not a haiku. It's um, a poet by a, a Zen Buddhist monk. His name is Senge Gibbon. I'm probably not pronouncing these names right at all. I'm just trying. Um, he who comes only his he who comes knows only his coming. He who goes knows only his end. To be saved from the chasm, why cling to the cliff? Clouds floating low, never know where the breezes will blow them. Yeah, I I love this book. So thank you, Melissa. <laughs> um, and I also was really inspired by certain um, symbolic representations in uh, their writing, like in regards to death. So I was, you know, referencing, I'm referencing some image to like birds and specifically ravens, which symbolize the soul of the deceased. Um, the sea, which is like a representation or the sky above the sea, which is a representation of like uh, a sort of heaven and mountains. Okay, so I'm gonna read my um, haikus now, and then I have one reading from the same book, which was also uh, gifted to me by Ron that I want to read at the end. Okay. Uh, number one. Whispers in my ear, a raven perched on a ledge, sounds like a damo. Two. 
sailing endlessly, eyes reach towards heavenly sky, poet in paradise. Three. What crowns now adorn the sultry heads of God above, of gods above, with more ruby or pearl? Four. Blossoms fall from high on an obscured mountain peak, your face a flower. Five. Not death, but Roshi, falling asleep and waking in a brand new world. And Roshi uh, is a way to describe um, death. Uh, so <laughs> I guess to explain, the Japanese people don't like to say that people have died specifically in their poetry. They like to, to describe more um, the way that they had passed. And Roshi is a, um, a description describing a person who has passed from old age. And number six, a world of dewdrops fall from westward horizon. They drip in couplets. And then I have one last poem of Ron's that I'm going to read. Your soul an eternal winter garden. Your soul an eternal winter garden, your face a flower. Charmed into bloom off season and alive with ecstatic movement. Your eyes, twin fluid petals, twin soft carpels, carved into close set cloisters of your brows. And I yearn to taste the pollen grains of you, the vegetal of you. The petals, the sepals, the pistols, the carpels, the kernels, the tendrils, the lentils of you. Thank you. All right, and now a very special guest. Lars, it's Lars. Hello, everyone. In honor of your friend, the poet Ron Weiders, I would like to read a poem. Thank you for your attention. I died last night reading the New York Times. It happened very quickly, took a couple of lines. I died this afternoon in front of a Walmart store amongst carts and trunks. Not one, must have been four. Never gets better than absolutely awful. This kind of death shouldn't be lawful. It was the same as a million previous times. We know this and need no third-hand rhymes. Pay close attention now, you fucking dunce. The purpose of my words is to kill us all at once. I died today just now. I'll die forever tomorrow. I got buried deep and alone, in constant sorrow. Thank you for listening. I think it was like early 90s or maybe the mid 90s. And, you know, Ron would be, re you know, being an open mic and stuff, and Ron would be there. And I would say, who is this crazy old man? I was like, I, I, for that, in those early days, I just didn't get it. I honestly just did not get it. And Ron never changed. It was me who changed. And I understand it entirely now. And I want to thank him for doing what he did. I want to thank him for being a supporter of all of us here in the Hudson Valley. Um, and I want to say, Ron, wherever you are, Keep on doing what you did. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Guy. Um, didn't plan uh, anything. Yeah, I saw Ron, I don't know, in so many different places. A lot in Woodstock, he read it. You know, the Colony on Monday Nights Forever, the Poetry Society there, the Harmony Evenings. I read with him in the cave. I think I saw him here. The last time I saw him, I was just scrolling through my phone because I thought I had photos. He, we were at the mothership because Harmony closed and was sold. Um, and Paul McMahon there opened up his place and uh, we had some readings there. 2019, I guess? I thought maybe went into 2020. But anyway, last time I saw him read, he was dressed as... He came in in full regalia, like a 18th century admiral at sea, all white, big, huge hat with feathers and and uh, all decked out. I I don't even know why. I think he just wanted to, um, and you know, it was just fantastic. It was some, it was actually something d even different than I'd seen Ron ever do before. Um, I remember once at the Bohemian Book Bin out on 9W, the, Teresa Casa used to have a reading there and we had like a Christmas dinner where we just, we had the reading and everybody had brought something. We just sat around and I, it was the first time I really talked to Ron and he was just, I don't know that there was anybody else as gentle as Ron. And you'd have no idea unless you talked to him. Um, if you saw him do one of his performances, you'd. I don't, I don't know what you'd think. I, it took, like Mike said, it took a while just, wow, what's going on? Who's this guy and what, what does he do? And he had other like sonnets and, and beautiful poetry that he'd write. And then I learned other things from his performances. Like I, I didn't even think it was possible as a human male to urinate with an erection. But according to Ron, totally possible. <laughs> he just, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, stuff. But he was, he was so sweet and gentle. And he was always supportive of me. He was supportive of other uh, poets. I remember he used to drive Donald Lev around to a lot of readings when Donald wouldn't be able to, to make it himself. And um, yeah, it was just really sad to hear when he passed. You know, I'd lost touch with him as you know, over the pandemic the last couple of years. So anyway, thank you, Ron. Thank you. Okay. Nice sharing with you all, all these remembrances. Uh, one thing I guess I can share is, it just came to mind is that he said a lot of outrageous things over the years. But the one thing he said that I thought was the most outrageous was, uh, I tried to deliver it, I ate the foreskin at the circumcision of Christ. <laughs> but, um, I want to read his poem, Pard Pardalis. And, um, there is an audience participation part, and we do need two groups, so, you know, they're not the same size, but on the chorus, which is Jaguar Cougar and Cougar Jaguar, do I need the mic? Okay, because I got to move around a bit. Uh, maybe I take it out. Okay. Okay. This is Pard Pardalis, and I think he said that he wrote it because he had a fear of cats and he wanted to just take them all in, something like that. Okay. Jaguar, cougar, jaguar, cougar, jaguar, jaguar, cougar. One more. Jaguar, cougar. Jaguar, cougar. Oh, cougar, jaguar.
right, here we go. Lion, tiger, leopard, panther, cheetah, bobcat, wildcat, bearcat, hard to see, ocelot, <laughs> ocelot, servile, marge, caracat, saber tooth, lynx, lynx, pard par, Dallas, guard of the palace, enhanced in chalice, royal, Bengal, snow, Siberian, rampart, Kachuni, Donsant, Passini, Felix, Frolic, Sphinx, Sphinx, Jaguar, And Olmec, Olmec, Nahatul, Tultec. This is a little fuzzy. Tarascan, Migstec, Tolan, Zapotec, Chalulu, Teo, Tihaka, Mayan, Aztec, Jinx, Sprawling, Scrawling, Snarling, Rearing. Stalking, pacing, walking, racing, climbing, bounding, leaping, pouncing on the throat, on the cage, on the cage and flanks. Manx. Jaguar. I see someone entered, and I was wondering, yes, who, who wants to come up next? Oh, well, I don't know. Scott, well, that's good enough. Come on up. Hey. Philip. Yes, I can see you. <laughs> Just give a remembrance. Give a remembrance. Gary, how are you? You too. Well, Ron was a, a special guy. Uh, I guess I knew him from almost when I first started uh, attending poetry events here, which was like in 99, I, I guess I met him. And uh, he offered uh, to give me a blow job a hundred times, <laughs> probably. Uh, I, I probably should say that I never accepted, but we were friendly and friends. Uh, he actually visited me. I, 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 I connect Ron with, with Donald Lev a lot because uh, there was a period where Donald was no longer driving, and, but he owned a car that I had sold Donald for a very small amount of money, and, uh, and Ronald Ron was, was driving it for him, so that was, but yeah, Ron was, was wonderful. I mean, he was, he was very, very uh, unusual. Um, good poet, absolutely. Uh, really had a, a nice uh, sense of music, rhyming at times, but not always, but really wonderful sense of music. Um, I remember participating in a few events where he asked me to be like a reader with him in in one of his perform. We did one at at Widow Jane's Mine that was really pretty cool. Um, I think that was the locomotive. What, do you remember the locomotive poem? What was the What was the title of that poem? It was like the the name of the locomotive was the, was the name of the poem. 
And he had a wonderful, I, I, had, I should have brought his book. I, he sent me, he gave me a copy of his book. Um, yeah, it's like a big picture book, right? It's, yeah, yeah, he gave me a copy of that. It's a wonderful book. And he was a former IBMer, <laughs> which was like the wildest thing. I never really talked to him about his tech background, because um, I have a tech background myself. I, I, I never really found out what exactly he did for IBM. It, it, it just seemed the oddest background for Ron. It's the last place I would have thought. I can't imagine him in a white shirt and tie, really. I guess I can, I guess I can, but um, what else to say about, I, you know, I didn't even know until I saw that this event posted that, uh, that he had passed. Um, I was sad, certainly. Um, yeah, Ron Whiters. Did anybody hear from Mikhail Horowitz? Mikhail always sung his praises. Mikhail was a, a fan of Ron's, which, yeah. Um, trying to think of, I mean, I, I, I was very fond of Ron, and uh, I'm sorry that he is no longer with us, at least corporally. Uh, let, let, maybe I'll read something from that book. Let's, let, let's, let me glance through that and, and read one. Here. Yes, yes. Oh, you have notes. Let's see. Hang on a second. Let me pick one that maybe I know a little bit and uh, I don't want to pick. He has some really long things in here, but I know there's some shorter ones. Yeah. Oh, here's, I mentioned Mikhail. I want to find, there's a whole series about Mikhail. But. Sorry, I'm not very prepared. I didn't, I, I wasn't, you sprung it on you, man. yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, that's okay, that's okay. I, I, I think I found one that I, I remember him doing this one. And actually, a friend of mine, okay, we'll do that. Kristallnacht. You're familiar with that? Yeah. I was trying to find one. Around. <laughs> How do you know that? You, had you picked it out already? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, right? Yeah, here we are. So it's a little, you know, it's a page and a half. <coughs> Let me just glance through it. Kristallnacht. Your name should have answered to the clarion call of festal, festive holidays. The chauffeur Shofar should have been standard bearer for you. You should have been a cry of wonder from the spirit of man rejoicing. You should have sounded a new age of harp strings and flutes. Your name should have revealed patterns of moonbeams on Jacob's ladder, a name to invoke the most intimate expressions of tenderness in human fellowship, a name to for protect forever 
in the sacred safekeeping of the soul. You should have been a memory to celebrate under glittering spears of candlelight. Kristallnacht, Kristallnacht. You should have rekindled a fire to distill all conscience with clarity. Your name should have been reserved for the finest of fine revealed delights in the hallucinatory visions of saints and prophets. Your name should have lighted menorahs, illuminated auroras, set off the splendor of faceted amethysts and sapphires. Your name should have graced ocean liners, streamlined express trains, lyric ecstasies by Wordsworth and Byron. Elves and angels should have danced to the invocation of your spirit. Crystal knock, crystal knock. Were your name to be welded to wonders even so trivial as these? What ear could possibly be unmoved by the magical music of your jubilant polysyllabic flights? Crystal knock, crystal knock. On 9th November 1938, you were the brainchild of Joseph Goebbels, a nightmare of smashed windows, an augury of arson, a harbinger of holocaust, and your name was Kristallnacht. What language is this to encompass such a gesture, such an affront to expression, and to joy, such an imposition on all that is holy, such an utter refutation of all that we can hope for in the pursuit of human brotherhood. Thanks, David. Ron, already. Phil, we're um, getting ready to close, but if you want to well, contribute a little something. What I went through today to try to find Greenfield, because you'll find out when we pass Facebook, Google, I couldn't find nothing. Wow, it took you a long time to get here, huh? I thought it was starting at 8 o'clock. Oh. That's what was in my mind. Yeah. Do you have anything you remember about him you want to? You know, I gave up a good job. And I went downstairs, all the way down in the building, into packaging. I just couldn't have taken it if I had been blessed with the mighty God to be feared with autoimmune deficiency in the laboratory of the Masonic Knights Temple, of seven, September 11th, 1941. MIA, Mission Impossible, accomplished. Groundbreaking for the GOP. Government of corporatisms. Government of Pentagon. I remember we sitting down and him told me about, uh, I think it was Phil, Phil uh, who uh, built the, ba uh, the bathroom? No. Who was it that built the bathroom? That built the bathroom for him downstairs. Anyway. Yeah. 
Bon voyage. Into the hereafter. Has a future mother to be. In an oceanless ocean. That got contaminated. If the paradise lost, then the great biblical flood. And the birth of the Atlantic Ocean as the Grand USA, Grand Ocean Canyon, drained into the volcanic oceans as Mother Nature rocked and Mother Nature rolled. And with a gentle kiss, no forced labor, sent Noah's Ark upon the crest of the surf of her waters. And here we are in the hereafter upon Noah's Ark. See you again, Ron. night. Robin, would you like to close for us? Hi again for the third time now. Um, yeah, I am so happy that we all got to say our piece about Ron. Uh, being the person, I think, who's known him the shortest amount of time out of everybody here. I think it says a lot that his impact has resonated over generations. And um, to me as in very <laughs> a very uh, messed up 18 year old coming here every week trying to just put my life uh, out to all those who would listen, I never felt judged by anybody here, and um, Ron was always someone who gave me the greatest form of what I'd like to call silent support. And um, yeah, I'll always, always remember him for that. He was uh, someone who came to my, like, I forget what it was called, like a, a specialized reading here. I did like for, uh, right after I got my first uh, book published, and he didn't say anything to me the entire time. Uh, after I read, he just handed me his book and said thank you, and that was really all I could ask for. And I think we all know Ron in many different ways, as we have said tonight, and I think it's, you know, like I was saying before, our way of paying our respects and our homage to him. and. I think now there's no way he won't be able to have a really peaceful transition and I hope he is living it living it up up there. <laughs> uh, so thank you Ron for everything and we'll see you when we see you. 